Well, let me introduce Jan Narvison. Um, Jan is a um, emeritus professor of philosophy at the University of Waterloo, um, author of uh, many uh, uh, papers and books, uh, including You and the State, uh, his uh, uh, book, uh, introductory uh, book on political philosophy, um, uh, a introductory book on ethics as well. Um, let me get the title right. Um, Are Liberty and Equality Compatible? I believe that's your most recent uh, book. Yeah, um, co-authored with Jim Sturba, yeah. Co-authored with Jim Sturba. Um, Jan is also the president of the Institute of, for Liberal Studies. And today, uh, and well, we could talk about um, chamber music as well, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that. Um, today, uh, Jan's going to uh, t uh, talk to us about when science is political. Governments today, more than ever before, make decisions about matters with heavy scientific involvement. We expect, hope anyway, that government is acting for the public benefit. In order to do so, it needs information about which, if any, sort of programs or initiatives will provide the benefit relative to their costs. The costs in their monetary form are borne ultimately by taxpayers who, let's remember, have no individual choice about paying them. Science's job is to get at the facts and to come up with theories that do the best job of tracking those facts so that we have maximal confidence about what will happen next and especially what will happen given a particular choice on our part. If the information from science is good, then we can get from our major premise, promote the public good, to our practical conclusion, do this or that or the other. But if the information is not so good, then what we are led to do may not be so good. In fact, it may at worst be disastrous. Consequently, it is extremely important that we be able to rely on our sources of scientific information. Now, science is pretty good at its basic job of finding out what's going on in the world around us. But there's another job, that of communicating its results to those with the power to do something about it in such a way that people who are fundamentally not scientists will not be misled and will get us on productive paths. But at this point, we come up against a problem. Some outputs of science are a lot more welcome to the political elites than others. Government's job is to benefit the public, yes. But while they're at it, political figures also have their ambitions and their interests to promote. They, of course, claim to act for the public good. But who knows what that is? Or rather, whose word do we, the public, take when we come to making our few political decisions, mainly whom to vote for, if anyone? Generally speaking, we, the public, mostly have two sources of information the politicians themselves, and the punditry, that is, those whose voices are heard on the public media, newspapers and such. Well, also, of course, there are books and articles in learned journals. The trouble is, books and journals of that kind are mostly read by the people who write the other books and the other articles and the other journals. Some few are read by some of the punditry, and by the time it gets to the general public, there's room for a great deal of slippage twixt cup and lip. Government's pursuit of the common good is especially, and not surprisingly, devoted to preventing the common bad. That's because people can pretty much take care of themselves when it comes to pursuing the good in their own versions of that. But they are easily alarmed about threatening evils, especially ones that they can do little or nothing about as individuals. This is especially where governments get into the act. What governments love is impending calamities which, happily, they and they alone, or so they claim, can do something about. And so there is also a temptation for the scientists on whom we depend to feed them the welcome information that things could be really bad unless they do something quite expensive to head them off. Why expensive, you might ask? Well, because the more expensive a government initiative, the more government jobs it creates, the more visible the department that does the work, and the more luster accrues to the politicians who discover the problem and its cure. In the past several, they get reelected, in fact. In the past several decades, the political world has been confronted with the possibility that what we humans do is making a difference to the climate in which we all live. This is far from the only matter that has found its way into the halls of legislatures from the lucubrations and laboratories of scientists, but it is by far 
the most substantial one so far. Um, yeah, after all, if human activity is affecting climate, and that climate threatens to become seriously detrimental to human life, then it behooves us to see whether we might do something to forestall the looming danger. And especially regarding the currently popular version, the threat uh, used to be called global warming, individuals as such can do very little. Notoriously, the weather has apparently not done as well in cooperating with the global warming characterization in the past couple of decades or so, uh, so that now the popular rubric is climate change, a richly ambiguous term with many advantages, especially because of the ambiguities from the politician's point of view, that is. Along with this has arisen the battery of rhetoric designed to put down any who question the current claims. The new, the new terminology invites application of a wonderful term of abuse, climate denier. Wow. Uh, who, after all, can deny the climate? <laughs> Horrors. Without quite indulging in this particular terminological abuse, serious journals such as The Economist, not to mention virtually every newspaper of any note in North America, have taken up the cudgels. Well, just what is the claim and why the cudgels? The claim, in very broad terms, is easy enough to describe. The idea is that people in burning fossil fuels are thereby increasing the atmospheric load of carbon dioxide, which in turn actuates the uh, famous greenhouse effect, resulting in increased temperatures. This not only results in hot climate, but also in warmer ocean waters, melting ice masses, resulting sea level rise, threatening coastal cities with inundation, and much, much more. You've all heard it often enough. You may even have read Al Gore's notorious book on the subject, An Inconvenient Truth, which people have, um, commentators have um, supplied some very interesting alternative titles to, but we won't go into that. So what do we do? Well, we reduce our CO2 output, that's what we do. That's the only way to ward off the threatening doom. That's the official story. And so there's a lot of emphasis on power sources that don't increase the CO2 supply. Water power we have had with us for a long time, but further development is inherently limited. Nuclear power is also clean in the newly adopted sense of that term. But of course, it's nuclear, and we can't have that, can we? <clears throat> so the new emphasis is on wind power and solar power, sources that have the apparently immense advantages of free fuel, wind and sunshine, that emits no CO2 whatever. And governments the world over have been investing in both sources of power for many years now. Other activities include shutting down coal-fired power generators and using gas turbines sparingly and grudgingly. One set of questions concerns the science and the engineering technology behind all this. We'll turn to that shortly. But first, let's talk a little bit about the political involvements inherent in these developments. Why political and why inherent? Well, political is distressingly easy to answer. In our liberal political climate, as I've said, government is supposed to be serving the people, the common good. And that good is understood in a nicely parochial way. Your good is what you want, broadly speaking. Well, among the things we want are certainly food on the table, roofs over our heads, and shirts on our backs, especially up here in places like Canada. A drastic change of climate threatens these things and does so for essentially all of us. Climate is everywhere, and except indoors, difficult to contain. If CO2 is the problem, well, you can't confine your emissions to the air around, for example, London, Ontario. It's bound to spread all over the place. Climate is inherently a public problem, and so controlling it is what economists call a public good. You can't confine the good to those who are willing to pay for it. It's bound to affect us all. And when this is so, inevitably the politician comes to the fore, or the soapbox. We must do something. Now, as I've said, the something that we must do is to avoid a calamity. That's what politicians love. It's what sells, politically speaking. Improving life is all very well, but avoiding threats, that's got real consumer grab. Tell your typical human that horrors await unless we all do something, and you've got a keen audience. Tell them that things are going pretty well, and well, that gets a big yawn. For a politician, good news is no news. <laughs> What's news is impending doom, plus the politician riding in with shining armor to slay the dragons threatening it. So there is an inherent interest on the part of politicians in the climate change story. It plays right into their hands. 
it's not quite as good as war, to be sure, but after all, wars are both potentially incredibly dangerous and much too easy to avert. The costs are not only in money, which people are readily willing to pay, um, but also in lives, which they are decidedly not willing to pay, at least not around here. But climate change, wow, its workings are arcane to ordinary people. CO2, what's that? Greenhouse gases, eh? And get a scientist going on this, and the ordinary person's reaction is to turn over and swoon. Well, if you say so. So the politicians tell us that science is behind his expensive initiatives, especially that 97% of the relevant scientists are, and they reward the scientists who support them hugely in turn, as so many contrarians have pointed out, the amount of money that's been spent on, uh, by the public on research into uh, climatology, research especially supporting the global warming hypothesis, is absolutely immense. And it, it totally dwarfs any kind of private money invested in the other side by, for example, coal companies. At this point, several clarifications about the issues are in order. Now, I've called them clarifications, uh, but, um, well, we'll explain. <laughs> now, to begin with, there is the empirical question. What changes have actually been going on in global temperatures? Here would seem to be a straightforward matter of fact, just a matter of thousands and thousands of temperature readings taken all over the globe and then um, integrated. Alas, things aren't so simple. A scientist friend of mine reckons that most of the increases in temperatures reported from these sources are due to, firstly, bad placement of thermometers, and B, increasing heat output from sources not far from those thermometers. If you have a thermometer anywhere near a, 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 an urban settlement, for example, it's going to be reading uh, way too high. And then after that, we have reports that the National Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, of the US jiggered its data in order to keep the record showing increasing global temperatures. I mean, there are things like that to worry about. Anyway, it does seem that there is general agreement that the world has warmed a bit since 1850, say, around roughly two degrees Fahrenheit. But in the media and from governments everywhere, the message is that we are on the point of burning up. I remember a wonderful cartoon in the uh, KW record long ago with a, a big kettle with uh, you know, um, us, the, the public, uh, boiling in the kettle and saying, um, sure, climate change isn't the problem or something like that. And we all got the message. But of course, the message is wildly misleading. Well, then the next question would be, well, then what's causing whatever? Well, I have to add one more thing. As maybe you don't know, um, there are several ways to measure global temperatures. And by far the most accurate one from all reports is the use of satellites, which um, uh, do a, a completely different thing from surface thermometers. Moreover, according to some things I've read, the global warm, the, the CO2 greenhouse theory has it that the changes are going to uh, happen in the upper uh, stratosphere first, which is where the satellites hang out. And if you look at the satellite record, there hasn't been nearly as much warming as there has been on the surface temperature record. And so, um, who do you believe? Um, all right, and there's that kind of thing. Well, that's uh, one of the sort of problem areas where uh, ordinary people just don't have a clue. Uh, and where the politician is free to pick his facts as he will, and of course he picks the ones as I've said. The next question, of course, is what's causing whatever changes there are, and here the official approved answer is man-made consumption of fossil fuels, which inject CO2 into the atmosphere. The public is not told about all the other things that might be causing such warming as there is. Now, there's an interesting article by a guy named Jeff Jacoby, who is not, as far as I know, a scientist, but who seems to be very, very clued in, uh, lists a sizable sample of these other variables, around 15 of them. And regarding none of these is the science settled. Now, as he points out, even if you attribute a credibility rating of 95% around each one, which would be way too high in many cases, that gives you, you know, around a 46% net probability in regard to predictions of what's going to happen next. Not too terribly um, um, fitting to the picture of this uh, uh, dramatic scientific consensus about what's happening. 
Students of the subject point out that all the predictions various scientists have ventured require enormous amounts of slightly dodgy computer programming. And the results, well, it seems that the IPCC itself reported some, that something like 105 out of 108 model projections overestimated warming since 1998. They also remarked that, quote, the long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible. Well, that's interesting <laughs> and doesn't you know, accord very well with what we seem to be told in the newspapers and whatnot. Perhaps the most important single scientific point for the layman to know is this. Um, the way CO2 works is not primarily by itself, but somehow in interaction with cloud formation. Clouds account for something like 95% of the greenhouse effect. CO2 makes up a tiny fraction of the total composition of the atmosphere. We're talking a few hundred parts per million. So if two CO2 is to make a huge contribution to climate change, uh, the theory requires that somehow it is forcing cloud effects that have this great effect. But what is the relationship? Well, um, it has been pointed out that the, um, you've probably all heard of the hockey stick um, you know, thesis. Um, but the real hockey stick effect is the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere something like that, this is where a projection would have been handy, versus the actual level of climate and temperature change, which is you know, something like that. Um, now, so the, the big problem in, the, the, in science is how do you get from here to there in a, in a credible way? Now, maybe this can be done. There are some interesting books on the subject, um, one of which I've read and been quite impressed by recently. But nevertheless, the point is it's, it's a big job, and there is not a uh, huge agreement about just exactly how this works. Uh, as one scientist noticed, the scientific puzzle is why IPCC, that's uh, the Intergovernmental Protocol for Climate Change, climate models predict large values for climate sensitivity, which is the sensitivity to CO2, while the observations show only small ones. I mean, that's in a nutshell the problem. There are many well-known facts about climate history that baffle proponents of CO2 as the primary driver of climate change. And many, many scientific papers claim that, for example, ocean cycles and the sun are the main climate drivers, etc. So we do have a fair bit of controversy uh, within the realm of science, and it's controversy that the public doesn't hear much about it. And then we have the question, well, what should mankind do about this problem insofar as it is one? Now, since we don't know quite what the problem is, that's <laughs> uh, the beginning of the problem. But then the answer is very simple for politicians and activists, reduce CO2 emissions. I mean, there's, in a nutshell, something that's pretty easy to get across to the public. And it is something that it is possible to do at immense cost a cost borne, as has been often pointed out, overwhelmingly by the relatively poor among us. We're the ones who are going to shiver in the dark. <laughs> Public policy should be driven by sober estimations of benefits and costs. That is to say, you shouldn't just be talking about all the good things that will happen if we reduce CO2. You should also be asking, how much does it cost? And then the question is, is it worth paying? Now, the policy on CO2 shows, alas, no such rationality. To take one very prominent, I think the most prominent example, over the past couple of decades, governments all over the place have taken to financing the generation of electricity by wind and solar energy. It sounds wonderful on paper, since after all, the fuel cost is zero. Other costs are quite another matter, however, and those don't get the same kind of press as the highly touted benefit of zero fuel cost. Zero fuel cost is easy to sell, and I do mean sell with a capital S. What especially doesn't get much press is the most obvious, glaring, and fundamental point about this kind of generation, namely that the sun doesn't always shine. In fact, it shines at maximum half the time, and the wind blows even less than that, as it turns out. <laughs> on average somewhere around 26%, according to uh, one engineer who has studied the matter carefully. Um, quote, even the excellent wind resources in our region in North Dakota, which is maybe the you know, most windy, standardly windy place in the, it's sort of the Falkland Islands of North America, are only able to generate about 40% of their rated capacity on an average throughout the year, 40%. Now, what about the other 60%? <laughs> That's a question which obviously needs to arise. 
So what do the generators of wind and solar power do when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow? You can't turn hydropower on at will. You can turn it off, but you can't turn it on. Similarly, you can't just hook up the nuclear generators during those periods. It takes them a long time to get up to you know, full power. And if you back off, then you're in for a long wait before you get back up again, etc. So what do you do? <laughs> the answer, you guessed it, folks, fossil fuel backup. But of course, that means that for every megawatt of installed solar and wind power, you have to have a megawatt of backup gas or coal-fired power somewhere in the background. You just have to do this. Otherwise, I mean, public don't really like having the electricity turned off for 12 hours a day. It's um, not something we, we are used to in North America. That's um, All right. So um, that means right off the bat that you are doubling the capital cost of electrical generation, more than doubling, really, because um, gas generation is very, very efficient, whereas the capital costs of wind and solar, especially wind, are huge. Um, <clears throat> so you're doubling those costs when you move to wind and solar. And some engineers have suggested, well, more than suggested, they have detailed the case that the amount of CO2 that you're actually saving by moving to wind and solar power, given the need to back it up with fossil, is practically zero. So this is the type of generation that simply requires huge and hugely unprofitable investment. Unprofitable except, of course, to the people who make and sell these generators to the public via the politicians who are very rah-rah for them. And that means that us, the ultimate consumers, will foot the bill. In Ontario, as I'm sure most of you are aware, that bill has run to well over twice the cost of electricity prior to the incursion into wind and solar. In Europe, it's even worse. And it's getting worse here. We read in the newspapers that our electric bills are going up uh, bang sako again next year. And it's essentially all due to the investment in wind and solar power. Now, someday, somebody will perhaps find a way of storing huge amounts of electricity so that during the dark and windless periods, we can all run on community batteries. That would solve the problem, but um, all the experts in that field say, no time soon, <laughs> if ever. It hasn't happened yet. Nobody thinks it's going to happen soon. And in the meantime, these utterly obvious facts about electrical generation are almost utterly ignored by governments. I don't know whether you've ever, if you've seen newspaper announcements about um, wind and solar investments by governments, uh, you never see any reference to this totally obvious fact about them. I wonder why not. Now, in an impressive recent book, an author named Dana Nacitelli argues that the official view has much more going for it than other sources make it sound like. This is the book I'm talking about that I read recently and which shook certainly my views a certain amount because you know he makes the standard view sound quite a bit more plausible than I thought it was. He cites many papers to support the view that by and large, climate science's predictions have been not all that bad and that the science behind CO2 as the main driver of current warming is pretty solid. And yet, when he comes to discussing solutions, he says, quote, we have the technologies to produce low emissions energy and we have more than enough renewable resources to produce all the electricity we need. Perfectly true, of course completely ignoring the utterly obvious point that I've been making, which is, yeah, but they only work at most half the time. It's quite a bit less than half uh, uh, overall. And then what do you do? He doesn't seem even aware of that problem, this man who has been expounding very carefully uh, and quite convincingly the standard point of view. It's a bit startling coming from this author who spends many pages accusing skeptics of doing the same thing, namely making fundamental errors at the outset. Oh, and then there is the question, what are the effects of trying to reduce CO2 output? Now, there are two important answers to this. In the first place, the initiatives proposed in several very expensive international conferences have been analyzed by interested scientists and found to be ex expectedly ineffectual in the extreme. The general situation is that every hoped for minute decrement in global temperature is going to cost another trillion dollars in one way or another. The estimates of the costs of CO2 reduction to the ultimate consumers vary enormously as a function of which side you're on. What do you know? But a second answer is, in the longer run, still more important. 
because what the politicized scientists of climate change don't mention is that CO2, far from being, as some have gone so far as to say, a pollutant, is, and of course has been known for centuries to be, actually the foundation of all life on Earth. In particular, carbon is the stuff of which plants are made. CO2 is, as it were, the oxygen of plants. <coughs> The oxygen we breathe in is produced by the plants, which in turn utilize the CO2 in the atmosphere. So the question is, what is the optimum amount? And now some people have begun to study this fairly seriously recently, and they've come to some very interesting answers. For one thing, it's well known that the owners of commercial greenhouses routinely pump in carbon dioxide so as to enhance the growth rate of plants. And the optimal level for plant growth is considered to be something like 700 to 900 parts per million, part, uh, parts per million. Roughly twice today's ambient contribution, which is approaching 400 uh, parts per million. Plausible estimates put the value of increased CO2 from fossil fuels in terms, for example, of forest growth around the world and uh, increased agricultural output at roughly $140 billion per year. That's a very conservative estimate. It is also noted that from 1961 to 2013, a period in which CO2 has been you know, um, jumping forward, Cereal yields per hectare increased by 85% in the least developed countries and 185% worldwide. That's big stuff. And of course, it has meant that, uh, well, there's an author named Indur Goklani who has written a very interesting paper about this, which you can get on uh, the web. Orthodox thinkers on climate change claim, says he, that global warming will, among other things, lower food production, increase hunger, cause more extreme weather, increase disease, and threaten water supplies. The cumulative impact will, they claim, diminish living standards and threaten the species. And if carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are not curbed soon, pose an existential threat to humanity and the rest of nature. Some claim it may already be too late. There's a group called 350.org which agitates for reducing atmospheric carbon dioxide levels currently around 400 ppm to 350 ppm, a level the Earth last experienced in 1988. Okay, since 1988, global gr gross domestic uh, product per capita has increased by 60%. Infant mortality has declined 48%. Life expectancy has increased by over five years. That's around the world, not just in favored places like Canada. And the poverty headcount has dropped from 43% to 17%, despite a population increase of 40%. Nostalgia for our 350 ppm world seems somewhat misplaced, if not downright perverse. Altogether, he concludes, on pretty reasonable assumptions and estimates, that the benefits of our use of fossil fuels outweigh their costs by somewhere around 50 to 1. <laughs> Conservatively, he says. Now again, there is much disagreement about this. Proponents of the standard science tend to insist that it is global warming that has the high costs. The trouble is whenever they list these high costs, the facts look as though they're quite the opposite. Those costs aren't nearly as obvious as the ones we incur by trying to reduce CO2 production right now. And all are at least somewhat speculative. Now, of course, the benefits to mankind of more CO2 is in considerable part the benefit of supporting more people. And perhaps some people wouldn't want to count that as a benefit, I don't know. Well, I'm sorry to have gone into such considerable detail on this matter, but uh, it's in order to illustrate, I mean, what is, after all, a, a serious, uh, in fact, the most serious, the most major world political uh, problem that's, uh, you know, that's causing all the turmoil. Um, so there, there's no general policy initiative in the world today that better illustrates this problematic relation between science and politics. Well, the short summary of this relationship at present then is this. Governments on the one have an intrinsic bias in favor of more, more government that is. In more or less democratic countries, this trend toward more is modulated by science. But the science in question concerns complex matters, than which few are more so than climate, and are easily perverted. Government spokespeople everywhere tout the costs of fossil fuel use, but pay no attention to its benefits. The polities they support are immensely expensive and very ineffective, even on their own narrowly defined terms. 
So what can be done about this? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm nearing the end of this paper because the shortest and most plausible answer is probably nothing. <laughs> And the reason is simple. As said at the outset, nearly everyone relies on government for their scientific information, which in turn means science funded by governments. But there's a powerful incentive to demonstrate the existence of frightening scenarios that can, it is thought, only be avoided by government action. It is very difficult to show that this isn't, necessar isn't necessarily true. It is possible, but it is very difficult, and not surprising that people tend to follow their leaders. In part, this is a hard to avoid consequence of democracy, which gives everyone a vote and decides the basic things by voting, by majority rule, or <laughs> not quite in the case of sorry, the recent case of the US. Ordinary people don't have time to study books on climatology or much else for that matter. We can expect that they will listen mainly to sound bites and sound bites notoriously favor alarmists. I do not have a ready solution to this sort of problem. Keeping on yammering, the standard academic response, is the best I can think of, and it's unlikely to do much, period. <laughs> Eva, Eva has a question. Well, first I have a comment. I, I'd like to give a title to your speech, and it would be this. Uh, a solution that doesn't work chasing a problem that doesn't exist. <laughs> That's putting it too strongly, but yes. <laughs> I mean, it's a problem that probably exists, but uh, yes. The, the, um, I, my question relates to your very opening uh, statement. Yes. Uh, namely that if the information is good, then the policy flowing from it will also be good. And then, of course, the other, that if the information is bad, obviously nothing good can come of it. Yeah. But I would, I would like to question whether good policy always follows from accurate mm -hmm. science. So, and you, you yourself actually brought it up later. Yeah. Sometimes the cost, uh, the benefits uh, uh, do not outweigh the costs. Yeah. Which brings me now to the conclusion, and uh, I'd like you to comment on this, that you describe this as only a problem of uh, the government, but we do have and should have countervailing institutions. And when it comes to the question of accurate science and the non-politization of science, the institution that concerns most of the people here is the university, our universities. Yes. And I would say to you that these are hotbeds of non-scientific, whole departments are yeah. hotbeds of non-scientific yeah. pseudoscience. May I add an anecdote to this of relevant go interest? Ahead, ahead. Uh, many years ago when I was still, you know, I'm a retired professor, but before I retired, um, for several years in a row, I was invited by the department across the campus. I mean, I'm a philosopher, for heaven's sake. Across the campus uh, was the Department of Environmental Geology or something like that. And among other things, they had a, a student seminar on, on global warming issues. And I was invited to come over and talk to the students. Why? Because it was too hot a topic for them, the alleged experts, to talk. But it was safe to invite somebody from across campus because, you know, I'm not right there, so they can't kick me out. So, so I would go and talk to them and bring up some of these facts about, you know, the global warming hypothesis. And it was all big news to the students. And the professors who invited me sat smiling in the background. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, one further comment on the first part of your comment. You're, you're perfectly right that accurate information, so far as it goes, isn't enough. It's got to be full information. And of course, my complaint is what's missing is an account of, as I say, the costs and not just the benefits of these policies. And if you take those into account, you get a very, very different picture. For, for the record, my name's Phil Sullivan. I'm an engineer from Hi, yes. the Institute for Aerospace Studies at the U of T and have semi-retired. My area of expertise is actually not climate modeling per se, but the, the mathematical techniques and the physics of the fluid flows that are involved in that area. There are several issues here. First one is your assessment of the uh, clean power situation is right on. On the issue of whether the validity of climate change, um, one has to be aware that uh, you can fall into the trap that critics of, of evolution, religious critics of evolution uh, push, which is what I think the philosophers would call fallacy of composition. 
That is to say, the assumption that if they can pick at some piece of evidence that, that makes their case, when in fact you have to look at a huge body of evidence and see whether there's some overall pattern. Yeah. The final thing I would say is that I have no personal position on this issue, but all of the colleagues that I've talked to that I have degrees, that have, I, I have respect for, that are in that area, feel that there is anthropogenic clim climate change occurring. Yes. Yeah. Um, the final point I would make is that, that it's, it's very easy for, for skeptics and others to say, oh, well, you only want this climate change research because you get the money. Um, and that, that, to me, is the lowest form of criticism. My impression of most of these people that are involved in there, they are people of integrity struggling with this issue and trying to come to terms yeah. with it. So that's, that's my take on it, if it's any help. Thank you. Yes. Point, point well taken. Yeah. I, I would like your opinion on self-selection in sciences, because I think if somebody right now puts in job applications in your average department that actually deals with climate change, and they put on there that they're critical of climate change, they have a close to zero chance of actually getting an yes. interview, let alone being hired. So um, it is not so much that the people that are in those departments do not believe in climate change. I think most of them actually do. But they are exactly in the departments because they believe in climate change. Yes. It, this is a very important uh, issue, certainly. Now, um, one reason I mentioned this book by um, um, this, this author was, I can't remember her name as quickly, but Dana um, Puccitelli. Uh, his book is called Climatology and Versus Pseudoscience. Um, and he claims that, um, you know, contrary to these stories, uh, editors, for example, looked at their papers and found real flaws in them. And he, he, he does set forth in convincing terms what the flaws are. And that's very important. Um, the question is, are they being rejected just because they're uh, opposed to the traditional, to the standard politically accepted view? Or uh, are they actually not very good? I mean, this is a very important question, and uh, very, very hard for us outsiders to answer. So yes, it does look suspicious that you know the contra con contrarians have a very, very hard time getting uh, jobs, and a lot of them are going to other institutes because they can't get jobs in universities because of their views. So it is a problem, and it needs you know, quite a lot of investigation. Yeah, uh, I might say in my paper, I'm I am um, not disputing the claim that there is anthropogenic global warming. I, uh, nowadays, essentially nobody disputes just that bare statement. The big question is how much and how much will it cost to do something about it, and indeed. Uh, how bad a thing is it? I mean, that's another thing that I didn't mention much in the paper, but after all, it's been pointed out that, you know, we in Canada, um, the Canadians spend an awful lot of time and money going to Florida in the winter, and but being a bit warmer isn't going to bother most of them all that much, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, the claims about, um, about melting ice sheets and so forth are, you know, wildly exaggerated usually. Um, I, I've seen one scientific paper report that the ice lost um, in the Greenland um, ice mass, which is the biggest one on Earth that counts, I mean, that's melting, they are not melting in Antarctica, um, is such that it would take uh, 600,000 years for it all to disappear at the present rate. Well, that's quite a little while. That's, you know, good. Al Gore gave you the impression that it was like the day after tomorrow. Yeah, it was a bit of an exaggeration. Um, I wrote a book on global warming, so-called, or climate change. I'm no expert whatsoever. I got interested in this many, many years ago, among other subjects, and I started researching it on my own. The book came out in 2012. It's called uh, Global Warning, The Trials of an Unsettled Science. Now, what is an amateur doing, presumably a Canadian poet, doing writing about such obscure and complex issues? Fortunately, my son is a full professor at uh, the University of Alberta. He runs his own lab, his, uh, his own scientific lab. He's in nanotechnology, but he also was in nuclear physics earlier and so on, was nominated as the best young scientist in Canada. He is utterly reliable. So he did, he did much of the research for me where I found I was incapable. The math, the graphs, the hockey stick, the, uh, the absurdity of Michael Mann's claim. He went through all of that, um, the computer models, because he's also a computer expert. 
And uh, he, was, he thought there was such a thing as anthropogenic, anthropogenic global warming. That was when I consulted him. I said, can you just look this up for me and do the research? Two months later, the reply came in. It's an enormous scam. And this is from one of the most reliable scientists in the country. And he had all the proof. As for the remark uh, that Phil made about trusting your, your compatriots in the scientific community, geologists, chemists, and so on, what my son told me is that nobody who is a contrarian in that field, who is anti, who I think many of us are, can get a job at the university. They're, they're, it's like conservatives in English departments. Yeah. If you just mention that you're conservative or you voted for a conservative, you're out. Yeah. Right? It's the same thing. It's the same thing with the scientific community now. So I don't think that Phil is utterly correct when he said it is one of the lowest forms of criticism. I think it's a major form of criticism because it actually applies to how the information is generated right at source. So I'll leave that there. That is not what I wanted to say. What I wanted to say was this, and I'd like you to correct me if I'm wrong. That um, statistics, uh, not a statistic that 97 percent of scientists we're on board with the global warming bandwagon, so to speak, is a fraudulent statistics. I think a statistic, I think it came out at the University of Arizona. This is where I want you to correct me, but I'm pretty sure it was the University that's, of Arizona. That's where you have to read uh, Puccitelli. He, he, did, he and his colleague did a huge study on this, and I'm afraid they've confirmed that 98% of, of, of climatologists do really pretty well agree that there is uh, Not according to at least some AGW in the last 50 perhaps, years. Perhaps, perhaps, but or just just uh, that you you really have to read that study. It's it's you know it's much more persuasive than I expected it to be. I mean, I I was certainly uh, <clears throat> um, I knew about the information you were telling me, and that's what I supposed was the case. But he gives a very strong case for uh, the other point of view. And you, you have to look at it. It's, even so, I mean, I'm writing despite this. Another thing I left out, by the way, of, of my paper, I mean, I didn't say enough about, was uh, the enormous, enormous fertility of science and engineering in coming up with solutions to problems utterly different from anything we know right now. Um, and, you know, this is, I think, where the future lies. Instead of spending trillions of our dollars trying to reduce CO2 in the ways that they're proposing to do it, uh, you know, we can, we can certainly expect that if the problem is perceived to become more severe as time goes by, there will be people out there finding solutions to it. And our confidence, my confidence in that is very, very high. In fact, they're already uh, at work on it. Um, it's, it's, you know, the future, when you look at the fertility of science, and especially engineering science, in solving practical problems, it's incredible. Um, did you know, for example, those of you who may have been worried about diminishing land availability for growing food in the world, that you don't need any land to grow food anymore? <laughs> There's a wonderful article in uh, the New York Times magazine about, right, about a month ago or so, ex in detailing how this company in Newark, New Jersey, has built um, a, um, um, a vegetable growing uh, industry in a building which feeds a lot more than just all the people who live in that building, and estimated that the entire megalopolis of New York could be internally fed without going to farms outside of the city at all by using these methods. It's just amazing. I mean, most people just have no idea. So the point is, the amount of land that you need in order to grow food nowadays per person is actually zero. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's very strong oh, stuff. Yeah. Uh, I guess to some extent you might have answered my first question, which was going to be about um, yeah, the, the polar ice caps melting and water levels rising, ocean levels, etc. And I think especially when you see footage like from Climate Earth and the polar bear that couldn't get food and yes. starved to death. Uh, so then I guess related to that, if you wanted to expand on that part, that would be great. Uh, but the, I think the, often the argument I hear is that, well, we might as well invest all this money because even in the worst case scenario, we're getting clean air, clean water, and that'll be good for both ourselves and future generations. I just want to get your yeah. thoughts on That's that That's not the worst case. I mean, in the worst case scenario, we're getting those things and we're also uh, having millions and millions and millions of people starve to death. 
And if you, you know, if you want to accept that cost along with the benefit of clean air for us rich people, sure. <laughs> but as I'm saying, it's only if you think that the existence of lots of other people is a good thing that my point is, uh, is, is relevant. Uh, if you're an enemy of mankind, well, it's another story, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you.